Hello, welcome to this Bible study, uh, the second in a series of two that deal with set, set how to uh, different ways of settling family disputes. Uh, last week we looked at the interaction between Jacob and Laban and how they settled their own dispute by making a peace treaty. Today we we'll look at Jacob and Esau making peace. Let us think back. Remember that uh, in the early days of Jacob and early, early years of Jacob and Esau, uh, Esau became very annoyed with Jacob because he felt that Jacob stole his blessing. And in fact, he, was, he vowed to kill his brother Jacob. And then the parents, Isaac and Rebekah, told Jacob to move to Padan Aram and uh, stay with his uncle and that they will tell him when it is time to come back. Well, Jacob moved to Padan Aran, uh, spent a little over 20 years there. During that period, he got married to the two daughters of Laban and uh, had uh, children, 11, uh, well, 12 children at this point, but 11 boys and one girl. Now he, God told him that it is time to return to his homeland in Canaan. Jacob decided, and we will find out through this Bible study, that he decided that he had to make peace with his brother. He had to make peace with his son. And today's Bible study is, to, is going to show us the process they went through and actually made peace. We will learn that Jacob was committed to making peace with his brother. For him, it was what he had to do. And he did everything, he covered every basis. In fact, he was determined to make peace even when it appeared that his brother was coming to him with hostile intentions. Uh, he didn't really know that. We were not told that the way he was coming was coming with a number of um, a large number of men that suggested that he was coming for hostility even in the face of this impending hostility jacob was determined to make peace and everything he did was geared towards making peace with his brother our study today will come from genesis 32 and genesis 33 Well, let us begin with uh, his message to Esau. After Jacob made peace with Laban, Laban departed and went back home. And then Leb uh, Jacob and his entourage continued on their way to Canaan. But before they continued, he sent people, sent emissaries, that's a peace mission, in fact, to Esau to go and tell him, to go and tell him that he, Jacob, was coming. And in the message he sent, you will find that he humbled himself by he referred to Esau as his master, referred to himself as Esau's servant, and then informed Esau that he has been staying with Laban until then. So what he did there was he gave an es gave Esau an update of where he was. Say, look, I've been with Laban and now I'm coming back home. Uh, you know, he, the, the way he described this or the way he presented himself to Esau uh, showed a lot of humility. The, let us read about this in Genesis 32 verses 3 to 4. Genesis 32 verse, verses 3 and 4. Yeah. Jacob sent messengers ahead of him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. He instructed them, this is what you are to say to my master Esau. Your servant Jacob says, I have been staying with Laban and have remained there till now. 
Well, the the people he sent, uh, he also told them, uh, in addition to telling them he's been with Laban, he also told them that he has become a wealthy person, that he has a lot of cattle, a lot of donkeys, uh, essentially giving an update, saying, look, this is what has happened, it's been a little over 20 years, this is what a lot has happened since these 20 years. I have become a wealthy person. I have uh, I was spending time with our uncle and uh, I'm sending this message to you to seek peace with you. So the messengers went and then they came back and reported to Jacob that yes they saw Esau that he was coming to meet Jacob with 400 men. Now, let us read about that before we talk about it. It's in Genesis 32, verses 5 to 6. Verses 5 and 6, Genesis 32. I have cattle and donkeys, sheep and goats, men servants and maid servants. Now I am sending this message to my Lord, that I may find favor in your eyes. When the messengers returned to Jacob, they said, we went to your brother Esau, and now he is coming to meet you, and 400 men are with him. Yes. So he sent message telling Esau, say, look, I'm sending this message. The purpose of this message is to seek favor in your eyes. And uh, the messengers returned and said, yes, we saw Esau. We gave him the message that he's coming to see you. But coming with him are 400 men. Now, 400 men is not exactly a council of relatives. There, there was something here that Jacob was clearly bothered. He didn't, he didn't think that Esau was coming in peace. And we don't really know whether Esau was coming in peace or not, but coming with 400 men is a little bit, maybe he was coming to show off or whatever, but it's a big show, whatever it is. So Esau was concerned, but he didn't give up. This is the most important thing here. He didn't give up. First of all, he divided his people into two groups and, and, and told one group, you know, separated them. And his intention was if Esau came and attacked, then at least the other group would, he will attack one group and the other group will escape. So that way, he, he, he made sure that whatever happened between him and Esau was not going to be the end of his family. He wanted to preserve something. But he didn't stop there. He prayed, and we're going to go through that prayer carefully. First, he called on, he called on God, said, Oh God of my fathers. He reminded God that, look, God, you told me that it is time to go and you told me that you are going to protect me. Let us look, read, start reading the prayer in Genesis 32, verses 7 to 9. Genesis 32, verses 7 to 9, verse 7. In great fear and distress, Jacob divided the people who were with him into two groups, and the flocks and herds and camels as well. He thought, if Esau comes and attacks one group, the group that is left may escape. Then Jacob prayed, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, Go back to your country and your relatives, and I will make you prosper. We'll read the, the rest of the prayer before we continue to talk about it. Okay, so... Verse 10. Verse 10, yeah. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I have become two groups. Verse 11. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me, and also the mothers with their children. Verse 12. Yeah. But you have said, I will surely make you prosper and, I, and will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. So here, 
Jacob prayed and, and his prayer went through and sort of reminded himself. Of course, when we remind God of what he told us, promises he made to us, it is really more, God doesn't need to be reminded. But when you remind yourself, you are sort of strengthening your faith that, that, that God will, you know, telling yourself the reasons why you believe that God will listen to your prayer. So he was reminded, he said, look, you have done so much for me. You promised me that I should go home and that you will protect me. And now my brother Esau is coming after me. He believed that Esau was coming uh, with hostility. But he didn't want to stop. He wanted, he prayed for God to save him from Esau. Then, so he divided, let's, let's track back a little bit. He divided his people into two groups such that if Esau did attack, he, would, he, he might destroy one group but the other group will run away, will, will escape. Then he prayed. After praying, the next thing he did is he set up uh, what the Bible describes as droves of gifts. That is, he, he selected animals, he selected from his belongings, he selected things as gifts for Esau. But selected these and placed them in, in, um, in zones between him. So he selected a group of animals, placed one, uh, one of his servants in charge and said, continue. And that servant goes, he selects another group, places another servant in charge and said, continue. And he told them, he instructed them and said, when Esau sees you, tell him that these are gifts that I'm presenting to him. And he said to himself that he, his hope was to pacify Esau with the gifts. So he, he, he's taken, he's done about three things. You know, one of them is protect his family, you know, divide his family into two so that at least something will be left if they were really attacked. The other one he prayed and then the other one he set up these what I call zones of uh, pacifying gift for his brother. So if he takes, if he gets to one and it's not enough, he gets to another one, it's not enough, he gets to another one. He, I think he had seven, seven series of gifts placed between, that Esau will have to pass through before getting to him. Let us read about this. It's in uh, Genesis 32 verses 13 to 21. It's a long passage. Verse 13. 13. He spent the night there, and from what he had with him, he selected a gift for his brother Esau. 200 female goats and 20 male goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 female camels with their young, 40 cows and 10 bulls, and 20 female donkeys and 10 male donkeys. He put them in the care of his servants, each herd by itself, and said to his servants, Go ahead of me and keep some space between the herds. He instructed the one in the lead, When my brother Esau meets you and asks, To whom do you belong and where are you going and who owns all these animals in front of you? Then you are to say, they belong to your servant Jacob. They are a gift sent to my Lord Esau, and he is coming behind us. He also instructed the second, the third, and all the others who follow the earth. You are to say the same thing to Esau when you meet him. Verse 20 to 21. Verse 20. Mm -hmm. And be sure to say, your servant Jacob is coming behind us, for he thought I would pacify him with these gifts I am sending on ahead. Later, when I see him, perhaps he will receive me. 21. Verse 21. So Jacob's gifts went on ahead of him, but he himself spent the night in the, in camp. the camp. He said, I will pacify him with these gifts. 
this gift that I'm sending on ahead. When I see him, perhaps he will receive me. Essentially, this is an attempt to say, okay, doesn't matter how annoyed he is, doesn't matter how bad he feels, I'm going to suffocate that bad feeling with my good deeds. So he set up these zones of gift for his brother to present, to sort of appeal to him and say, look, there is no need for this hostility. We are brothers. Let us find a way to make peace. Well, after all this is done, uh, Jacob spent the night there and, um, you know, he had sent his servants ahead with all the gifts that he prepared. The next day, he, he went with his family. There are other things that happened between here that we have skipped because we want to focus on this interaction between Jacob and Esau. So the next day, he left with his family. He separated his family into three groups. He was still, he was determined to meet with his brother. He, you know, what, what he could have done here is run away. But he realized that running away would not solve the problem. So he was determined to meet with his brother. And he was determined that that meeting would be peaceful. He has to find a way to make it peaceful. So the last, at the last bit, he separated his family into three groups. The two maid servants, Bilhar and... Uh, forgotten the other name. The two maid servants were placed in front with their children. Remember, each of them had two children, so it would be four children and, and their two mothers. Then after that, there was Leah and all her children. So they, they were the second group. And then the third group was Rachel and Joseph. And then Jacob himself went ahead of them. He stayed in front and you know, kept his family, his uh, wives and children behind him. But he stayed in front of them, divided them into three groups again, believing that if something happened, at least they have, some of them will have a fighting chance. Let us look at Genesis 33, verses 1 to 3. Genesis chapter 33, verse 1. Jacob looked up, and there was Esau, coming with his 400 men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two maidservants. He put the maidservants and all their children in front, Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph in the rear. He himself went on ahead and bowed down to the ground seven times as he approached his brother. Jacob bowed down seven times as he approached Esau. He saw Esau coming and this is the last effort to, come, to tell Esau that look, I'm coming in peace. I'm coming, I want us to make peace. Can you imagine this kind of humility? that he actually bowed down seven times in coming to meet with his brother. Of course, when he and Esau met, there was no hostility. They embraced each other in peace and they wept. The Bible said they wept. And then the rest of the family bowed to Esau and they met up with them. Let's look at Genesis 33 verses 3 to 7. Verse chapter 33, verse 3. Yeah, verse 3 is repeated, kind of, yeah. He himself went on ahead and bowed to the ground seven times as he approached his brother. But Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Then Esau looked up and saw the women and children. Who are these people with you? He asked. Jacob answered, they are the children God has graciously given your servant. Then the maid servants and their children approached and bowed down. Next, Leah and her children came and bowed down. Last of all came Joseph and Rachel, and they too bowed down. So the meeting was peaceful after all. There was no hostility. Jacob, uh, 
you know, it's, it suddenly didn't want the gifts actually. It's, he asked, what is all this that you have presented? And Jacob said, look, I'm offering this to you to show you how much, you know, I care about you and all that. He saw they didn't want it, but Jacob insisted and persuaded Esau to accept the gifts. So Esau accepted the gifts. Then it was time for them to depart, for every, every person to go his way. But Esau offered to accompany Jacob home. And Jacob declined. He didn't want it. He felt that, um, well, we don't know what he felt, but he told, Je he told Esau that that the their their speed and this the speed he has to move he had to move slowly with his herds and with the children and that uh, if he were to drive them to move at the speed that Esau and his people will move that uh, he might he might drive them to death that uh, they were not fit for that kind of fast movement so he again convinced Esau to go his way Esau wanted to send some of his men and along with Jacob at least. But Jacob said no. And so Esau departed and went back to his own home uh, in uh, Seir, where he came from. Then Jacob continued towards uh, uh, Canaan. There is again a long Bible passage. Let us read 33 verses 8 to 20. Yeah. Chapter 33 verse 8. Esau asked, What do you mean by all these droves I met? To find favor in your eyes, my lord, he answered. But Esau said, I already have plenty, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. No, please, said Jacob. If I have found favor in your eyes, accept this gift from me. For to see your face is like seeing the face of God. Now that you have received me favorably. 11. Please accept the present that was brought to you, for God has been gracious to me, and I have all I need. And because Jacob insisted, Esau accepted it. Then Esau said, Let us be on our way, I'll accompany you. But Jacob said to him, My Lord knows that the children are tender, and that I must care for the ewes and cows that are nursing their young. If they are driven hard just one day, all the animals will die. So let my Lord go on ahead of his servant while I move along slowly at the pace of the droves before me and that of the children until I come to my Lord in Seir. Uh, 15. Mm -hmm. Esau said, Then let me leave some of my men with you. But why, why do that? Jacob asked. Just let me find favor in the eyes of my Lord. So that day Esau started on his way back to Seir. Jacob, verse 17, mm -hmm. Jacob, however, went to Sukkoth, where he built a place for himself and made shelters for his livestock. That is why the place is called Sukkoth. 18, after Jacob came from Padam Aram, he arrived safely at the city of Shechem in Canaan and camped within sight of the city. For a hundred pieces of silver, he bought from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, the plot of ground where he pitched his tent. There he set up an altar and called it El Elohe Israel. El Elohe Israel. So that was his first set, the first settlement that he called Israel. What we had uh, skipped in this story was that during that night, after he had sent his servants, Jacob actually met with an angel of God in which they wrestled and uh, the angel changed his name actually it was God himself he changed changed Jacob's name to Israel so when he met this camp and called it El Elohe I would say this was the beginning of the Israeli settlement in the Middle East but let us go back to the subject of today and that is the Mac what happened that led to Jacob and Esau making peace? First, we learn about Jacob's commitment. You know, he was determined to make peace with Esau. Even when it appeared that Esau was coming to fight him, that Esau was coming with hostility. 
Two things he could have done was, well, try to organize the fight. Of course, he didn't have the force to fight. Then he could have run away. But he decided he wasn't going to run away. At, at worst, maybe let whatever will happen, let it happen. But he didn't leave it entirely to fate. So, he, yes, he anticipated the worst and to, to cushion the shock, to cushion the impact. He divided his family, his flock, not really his family, he divided his flock into two and said, okay, let one group go, uh, let one group get ready to meet with Esau and suffer whatever he will come with. Then if something, if he comes with something bad, then the other group can, can, can escape. Then he didn't leave it to that. He prayed. He asked God to help him to protect him from his son. That's the second thing. The third thing, he prepared all these gifts for his son to say at least I'll pacify him with all these gifts and hopefully he will accept me. Then the fourth act was that when he was about to meet Esau, he bowed seven times in order to meet Esau. Why did Jacob do all this? Uh, maybe Jacob believed that peace was his only option to preserve his family. Remember, God had promised him that his descendants will be like the dust of the earth and, you know, that will be innumerable. And he has started a family that had uh, 11, 11 boys and uh, one girl. So he wanted to preserve, and this is speculation now, the Bible didn't say that, but we have to put things together. He wanted, he must have won, he must have been concerned about preserving his family and felt that making peace with his brother was his best bet of preserving his family to give them a chance to grow to what God had promised him will come out of his uh, descendants. Well, remember that he had just come out of a successful peace settlement with Lebanon. Maybe that motivated him. That after seeing how he and Lebanon made peace, uh, they themselves were very annoyed with each other and were, it's quite possible they could have gotten into a fight. But they realized that the best way to settle their dispute was to make a treaty to prevent, to reduce the chance of future disputes. So maybe he was motivated by this peace settlement. That made him believe that peace with Esau would after all be possible. Maybe he realized that making peace with his brother was worth whatever sacrifice he had to make. Whatever, he, he humbled himself lower than the lowest that anybody can think of. And so he felt that if that's what it would take, if that's what he had to do to make peace, that it was worth it, that it was worth the sacrifice. So what was successful here? Well, um, Well, let us, let us analyze his approach a little bit based on what we know. Um, some of the preachings we've had on peace uh, from the New Testament. First of all was uh, James uh, 2 verse 17. Um, no, we didn't set up to read this. James chapter 2 verse 17 in which James talk about faith and deeds. In other words, having faith is one thing, but backing up your faith with actions, with doing things to follow up with your faith is another. And maybe this is an area where I can give my wife a chance to, to say something. Because I think that the when Jacob prayed and still continued to do things to prepare for peace, 
that this is an illustration of what James was talking about when he said faith should be accompanied by action. Go ahead. Um, yeah, um, uh, I just got the passage. Maybe we should start by reading it. Okay. James 2.17 In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. So faith without works, in King James Version, you know, is dead. Now, I, while listening to this, you know, your, uh, my husband's teaching on this, I find out that, you know, yes, starting from this, Jacob, first of all, prayed. When, if we take the sequence of what he did, he decided he was going to make peace and then he started to walk towards that peace what did he do he prayed and you see this comes to my mind that making peace is not something you just get up and do haphazardly when you have decided i want to be at peace with this person i want to make peace with this person that i'm not at peace with or that I have a strange relationship with is something that you have to work at is something that you have to structure systematically for it to achieve what you want it to achieve because if you do things haphazardly it might either send the wrong message or accomplish the wrong thing now he prayed for God reminding God of God's promise to him now when we come to god with his words the words that he has spoken over our lives that he has given people men and women to speak over our lives the words that we have received directly from him when we come back to him it doesn't mean he has forgotten but it's a demonstration of faith it's a demonstration that lord i believe that word that is why i am reminding you that you said this thing you said this concerning me and i believe it that is an action of faith. And when you go back to God with his words, it helps to ginger him because you have shown that I trust you. I trust what you said. Because if you don't believe it in the first place, you will not be reminded, you will not be saying it back to him. Yeah. Okay. So he prayed saying that back to God. This is what you said. And then he took a step. Because once, once you pray, we might be thinking, oh, David, uh, Jacob divided his flock. These are wisdom that come from, you know, the Holy Spirit. And in as much as he had faith that, oh, I'm going to make peace, he divided his flock and said, I'm still keeping at it. So he was still walking towards, you know, joining works to his faith. And then, every other thing he did, you know, was to show increase his faith that yes i am going to do this thing and i am walking towards it faith without works as we can see from james 2 17 is 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 dead and god does not really you know walk with that kind of with that kind of thing he encourages us to add works to our faith and another thing that i i i can actually see from this teaching is is the the power of sacrifice the power of gift the power of gift even with god sometimes you you know when you when you are overjoyed or when you need something you can provoke god with your with your with your with your offerings with your sacrifice with your gifts there's a way you can even now the same thing goes with earthly you know our brethren our fellow human beings there's a kind of sacrifice that somebody will give you a kind of gift that somebody will give you even if you your heart was so black concerning that person it just has a way to disarm you and jacob knew that jacob had that wisdom from the holy spirit and he decided to make such gifts when another person we saw that did this kind of thing was solomon when he was celebrating god and he was slaughtering animals littered the whole street with the blood of animals or he was sacrificing to god another person is david 
David always praised God with excess, reckless abandon, excess of praise. You know, so these are offerings that we offer to God, and they have a way of opening doors, no matter how sharp that door is. Yeah. And finally, we I, I saw the power of humility. Yes. The power of humility. You see, if you are humble, God will lift you up. If David, I keep calling David. Yeah, Jacob. If Jacob <laughs> went to Esau and you know was bragging or proud. I'm, I'm not quite sure what the 400 men came to do, but yeah. he could have turned another way. Yes. But he brought himself very low. You know, there's something that says, he that is down needs fear no fall. Yeah. You know, when you are that low, where, where is uh, uh, the Esau going to kill him? And he's already brought himself yes. that low. So the power of humility. And uh, maybe later I will talk about what I learned, you know, comparing this David's approach to peace, uh, Jacob's approach to peace, to the approach he had with Laban. Yes, okay, that would be good. We'll, we'll come to that because we still have some time. But let us look at, you know, what, what did Jacob, did Jacob accomplish anything? We know that they made peace. The, was it what he did that led them to peace? Or was it so? coming for peace all along. We will never know that. We don't know his source original intention, but somebody that is coming to meet with his brother that brought 400 men, definitely intended the 400 men to do something for him, and we don't know what it was. It is possible that Esau set out to make peace with his brother also. But the important thing is that David didn't leave things to chance. He took every action necessary to make peace with his brother. Uh, before, let, let, so we learn a lot from this about making, settling family disputes. But before I summarize this, I would like uh, my wife to give us the comparison with the incident with Lebanon. Because these two Bible passages actually um, are somewhat together because they tell us about interactions between Jacob and other people, Jacob and his uncle, and then Jacob and his brother. And in each of these, there was a peace settlement. There was a settlement of a dispute, a long standing dispute between Laban and Jacob. It was a business dispute. Then between Jacob and Esau, it was a, a more critical dispute, actually. Okay. Yeah, um, if we look at the two, um, the, the two peace procedures or the two events, peacemaking events, the, the, the case with Jacob and Laban was much more traumatic, much more, uh, you know, involving too much finger pointing, too much accusation. They even had to bring a council of relatives. They had to bring a third party, yeah. so to say, to settle, either witness the dispute or settle the dispute. Okay? Because none had come out set out for peace. None of them. Yeah. Laban was pursuing Jacob so that he can recover in anger. So they can recover everything, recover the, the gods of his father that was taken. And why did you go away? You took away my children. And you did all this, you did all that. You know? And Jacob was saying, what did I take from you? After all, why are you pursuing me like a criminal? I have served you. I have done this. There was no, none of them set out. Oh, I'm, Laban didn't say, I'm going to just make peace. Let me see my children and go away. Yeah. Jacob did not say, is, the fa is my father-in-law? I have been with him, so let me just relax. There's nothing more he can do to me. He's not going to kill me because of his daughter. Let's, we are one family, let's make peace. No. But they were both out to, you know, continue in their war. But, you know, I believe it's the Holy Spirit that was guiding Jacob, the God that was guiding Jacob, that intervened and 
In fact, he went to the point of Laban searching their property. Yeah. And when he didn't find it, only God knows what would have happened if he found the God, yeah. the God he was looking for there. So the peace came, but it wasn't, honestly, if you ask me, it wasn't a peace that was, that is lasting, or the peace that looked like it will last. Because remember, they had to make a covenant, they had to make a treaty, yeah. make a covenant. Because they still did not trust each other. They said, so this, will, this rock will stay between me and you so that you will not cross it to do me harm and I will not cross it to do you harm. Yeah. They needed a witness between them, which was God. So that peace was achieved, but it was, to me, it's a delicate peace. It was a peace that was, you know, um, you still didn't have all the rudiments of it. But on the other hand, we look at the peace between uh, Jacob and Esau. I believe a lot of it was because of the approach. The approach to the peace. Jacob came seeking peace in his heart. We don't know what Esau came seeking, but like my husband said, 400 men, not, not his brothers and his sisters, not his children, it could be for anything. It's certainly not, oh, I want you to come and welcome my brothers. Mm -hmm. You know? It could be for anything. The Bible doesn't tell us what it is for. But it's not far-fetched for us to see that it could be for war, it could be for whatever. But Jacob set out his mind to make peace. And then he went out lavishing gifts. Lavishing gifts. You know? And humbled himself. That is enough to disarm anybody. And therefore, at the end of the day, they didn't need any truce. They didn't need anybody to come and... Number one, there was no third witness yeah. to separate them. And that's the kind of thing that God is asking us for. It's only when we cannot make peace between us that he will say, go and tell the elders in the church. But the first thing God wants us to do is to be able for the two people to make peace. For the brother to go to the brother and make peace. Okay? And then, at the end, it's not just that they agreed the whole thing became peaceful. Esau volunteered to escort um, Jacob or even leave his men so that they can protect him. Mm -hmm. So to me, that is a much, much more lasting peace that you don't need to be afraid of one another, what could happen tomorrow. So in other words, if you compare and com contrast the two procedures, I will take the procedure of peace that Jacob had with Esau any day over that of Jacob and Laban. Yeah. Yes, definitely the peacemaking illustrated in this week's passage uh, in fact captures very well what Paul said to the Romans in Romans 12 verse 18. He said, live at peace with everyone if it is possible and as far as it depends on you if you find that passage i would like us to read it as, as a closing thought uh, but while she's looking for it the, this tells us to do two things said live at peace with everyone if it is possible so when you hear if it is possible you think that that is letting you off the hook what that is really saying is you should explore all the possibilities. Please read it if you find it. Romans 12, 12 verse, 12 18. verse 18. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Everyone. If it is possible, means explore all possibility. Just like uh, um, Jacob did, he explored every possibility to find peace. So explore all possibility. Then the second part that says, as far as it depends on you, is even more, uh, more committed. Because what he's saying is that there is something you can do. And whatever it is, whatever role you can play to make peace, that you have to play that role. Said, as far as it depends on you, which means do the things that depend on you. So these are not letting us um, off the hook. They are rather telling us we don't have a choice. 
live at peace with every person explore all possibilities and if you do explore all possibilities it's difficult to come back and say you didn't find a way to make peace then he said even if the other person is not doing his part that's why he said as far as it depends on you which means whatever is your part do it irrespective of what the other person is doing and this is this illustrates clearly what Jacob did as he approached Esau to make peace. And this is what Paul was telling the Romans or telling us through this letter to the Romans. And it's very, um, as I was going down this passage, I think there's something that is quite apt in, in all this when we talk about banking your blessings. Yeah. The things you do in order to end blessings if you go down that passage and uh, i was i was uh, reading that just as we were speaking mm. if you go to verse 19 it says do not take revenge my friends but leave room for god's wrath for it is written it is mine to avenge i will repay says the lord on the contrary if your enemy is hungry feed him yes if he is thirsty give him something to drink in doing this you will heap burning coals on his head do not overcome evil do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good with good Over. so it does not matter how how aggrieved you feel yes how offended how you feel the person has offended you pursue peace because as you do that you are any rewards. You are yes. any blessings from God. Yes. Okay. That brings us to the end of today's Bible study. And we pray that those who have opportunity to view the video or listen to the audio will learn something that will make a positive impact on their life and bring them closer to God's purpose for their life. We thank you for listening or viewing. Thank you and God bless you. Merci.